started the recording and uh, thank you all for being a part. Uh, if we can, let's, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer uh, today before we get started. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this opportunity to once again come together to study and reflect upon your word. God, I thank you for those who are joining in on the Zoom today. I thank you, Lord, for those who will watch the, the study later and, and participate in that fashion. Lord, we pray your, your blessing as we talk and reflect upon scripture. We pray that we would uh, hear your voice through our conversations, that, Lord, we would understand how you are using the words of scripture to speak into our lives and to our certain circumstances today. Lord, uh, let your Holy Spirit guide us and inspire us as we talk this morning. And Lord, may we be encouraged by your word. We lift this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so today we're going to be... Uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And um, as I kind of talked about last week in, 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 the, in the study guide material that I uh, prepared for this week, um, really the theme that I think I, I want to focus on in, in, this, in this particular part of Paul's letter is uh, kind of the, the lessons in leadership that, that Paul uh, is, is, I think, really talking about and, and reinforcing in this part of the letter. Uh, there'll be certainly some other issues that we may touch on as we go, but, um, but I think the theme of leadership is really one of the key themes of, uh, of this passage. And so, uh, but before we got into the passage, I wanted to kind of introduce the passage uh, and introduce some of the ideas we're going to be looking at by, uh, by just having a kind of a brief conversation um, to kind of get us thinking about, I guess, how we as the modern day church think about leadership. And, um, and the way I want to kind of get into that is this, um, you know, a lot of you, uh, especially a lot of you who are here right now have been connected to a, a church for a long time. A lot of you have been leaders in the church. Uh, some of you may have been part of a uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a search process. You may have been part of a search committee, either for a, a pastor or for an associate, a music minister. Uh, others of you uh, may have served on a church nominating committee, uh, trying to find folks to serve on stewardship committees or personnel committees, facilities committees. Um, and I guess the, the, the question I want to ask is I want to pull on those experiences and I'd like to hear from you a little bit, I guess, first off, how do we determine the qualities, the characteristics that we look for in leadership in the church today? How do we determine what qualities, what characteristics we want in either a professional staff person or in a, in a volunteer leader in the church? How do we determine what, what the necessary qualities, the necessary characteristics of that particular leader are. We're not asleep, we're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I hit you with one kind of out of the blue, so I'll give you a minute to think about it, so. Uh, Barbara, can't hear you. I'm not sure what, it doesn't say you're muted, but for some reason you're talking and we're not hearing. Okay, all right. Yeah, not sure what happened there. I, th I think, Mark, that first and foremost for me is uh, whatever position people are in, especially within the church, that they're, they're setting an example basically within their life. It could be uh, service in a particular area that they may have expertise in, but they're also willing to share that. Uh, I think in this day and time, in some churches, I'm not saying ours, I'm just saying the church with a capital C, 
uh, it's a situation of are they willing to team and work together? Mm. And even in the business world, I remember in my business career, it was very difficult for people to switch over to a team concept mm. of sharing. And uh, in this example, I'm going to use Barbara, but I would say, I see you're drowning. Is there something that I can help you with mm -hmm. that type of team and mm -hmm. just basically living their life to the fullest mm -hmm. and encouraging people to, to basically join them in mm -hmm. whatever the, the mission or the goal is for whatever it is they're doing. Okay. And they don't want the glory. They want, God to have the glory and they don't want to be the standout person. Here's what I did. Here's what I have done instead of here's what we do. Mm, mm. Yeah, those are, that, that's great. Those are, those are, I think that's really, that's really important. And, and Ronnie, I, I think both, all of that is really some really good observations. That, and I think especially, you know, I think Ronnie, that sense of that, the importance of the, shall we say, of being able to work with others uh, in the church has become even more and more, I think, an, an, an essential quality that we look for in leadership, whether it's, again, professional staff or, or whether it's uh, lay leadership. So. No, still can't hear you, Barbara. In the Methodist church, uh, you often hear people speak of gifts and graces Ooh. in leadership. Mm gifts being it, abilities mm -hmm. and graces uh those those characteristics of the spirit which would lend themselves to working as a leader hmm. Hmm. i'm curious i mean as we think about those qualities as we think about those characteristics um I guess, how, how do we assess whether somebody has those qualities or those characteristics? You know, Ronnie, Ronnie talked about, you know, seeing somebody maybe like in their workplace environment. Um, I mean, it, is, is, that, is that how we assess those kind of qualities and those characteristics in person? Is it by observation? Is it, how do we assess that in, again, in, in an individual we're looking at to, to, and ask, to ask to serve as a leader in our church? It may be having to ask others mm. uh, that they serve with. Mm. 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 Asking other people how they, how they, you know, do these, do these people exhibit right. these kind of qualities in, in, in how they relate to others and how they do their work, do their, carry out. Exactly. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, in the, in the range of music, it doesn't take much to, to determine whether or not you have someone who is capable mm. if they are not, if they don't have the ability. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's usually, uh, if you're, if you're looking for someone who is going to be an organist or a pianist, uh, all you have to do is put them on a keyboard and you pretty, pretty well can determine whether or not they right. have the qualifications. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think one important thing, we all have gifts that God has given us, but I think within the entire church, at any church, we have numbers and people that really and truly don't realize exactly what their gift is. Mm. And I think a true sign of a good leader within the church, from the staff all the way down to any of us, is to try to observe and better understand what their interests are. Mm -hmm and do everything that we can to get them involved. Participation to me is a true gift. A, a leader should always strive for participation uh, within the church for, for everything uh, and trying to, you know, you've always heard the saying, uh, if you don't know what your gift is, uh, I'll use myself at Temple, ask me and I can give you a whole lot of hints just off of ob observations that I and all of you folks have done to say, you really and truly would be good at doing X. Uh, and so, and like we said earlier, and you said earlier, Mark, everybody's not cut out for serving the exact same way, but everybody's cut out to serve in a way. 
I think, you know, Ronnie, I think that's an important idea, too. Um, you know, that's one of the things I've seen within the, the world of the church. I think sometimes we overlook that ministry is that sometimes, sometimes as the church, we can, we can, we can see gifts in others that maybe they struggle to see in themselves. Right. Um, and, and I think sometimes as, you know, as the church, it, uh, we have this amazing opportunity to to really develop leaders um, by by encouraging people to serve in those capacities um, that maybe if, if left to their own their own inklings, their own self awareness, they might not no, naturally choose for themselves. Um, but others see this gift, they see this potential, they see these these talents, these graces, I'll even use the, the, the word that mom used there. Um, and, and, and they say, you know what, we feel like you have the capacity, the capability, the calling to serve our congregation uh, and to serve the Lord as a leader within our congregation in this way. Um, I think that's, that's an important aspect of the, of the church community that sometimes we don't maybe give enough credit to. So, Am I back? Yes, you're back. Ah, good. I was going to say, a, a leader needs to have a vision. Mm. A leader, leader needs to know where they're going and where they want, and then they need to be able to bring people along. Mm. But they also have to be flexible in their leadership, in their vision. Mm -hmm. So sometimes others of the group may say, yes, but I see us needing to go over here first before we can go where you want to go. And so the leader has to be willing to, to flex mm -hmm. with the group um, while keeping his or her vision in, in mind, but being able to flex to get input from other people. Because people will follow you if they feel like, they will follow a leader if they feel like the leader values their ideas. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, 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 I can say this since she's here on the Zoom. Um, one of the first lessons of leadership as, as a minister that I can remember learning was from my mom, who, when we would go on mission trips, she would hammer into our heads. She would be, you know, she led many of our mission trips. And the first thing she would hammer into our head is the key to every successful mission trip is flexibility. Flexibility. Um, oh, yes. So, um, and, and to this day, I still hear that ringing in my head. I hear her voice. Um, but you're right. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it, it is, Barbara, it's that, that combination of vision, of, of having a vision, a sense of where God wants to go, but understanding that sometimes the path to get there um, may not be the, the, the shortest path. It may not be the straightest path. It may not be the simplest path, but it, it may be having to flex around obstacles or uh, around things you don't anticipate um, but that you can still reach that, but should be willing to go different ways and use different methods than maybe what originally planned. Um, I think Paul's a great example of that. Um, we have the story about how, you know, Paul wanted to go uh, and visit one place, and, and, and as he said, nope, sorry, you know, the Lord closed that border off to us. And then in a dream, I had a dream of a man from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. Um, you know, Paul had a vision but he also had the flexibility to be willing to, shall we say, veer off his path when necessary. I think there's also a need in leadership to be able to share the responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Mark, in regard to Paul's vision, uh, do you think um, after being thrown out of uh, three cities, by the time <laughs> he got to Athens, you think some of his team was beginning to question that vision to come over to Macedonia? <laughs> I believe I, I can almost guarantee it, Dave. I think that's a great. I think that's a great question because, um, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I think it's that it, it's that question of defining success, um, because in a lot of ways, if you look at especially this this kind of this phase of Paul's missionary work, um, by a lot of the measurements, the metric measurements, Paul did not have a successful missionary vision. 
<laughs> when you started, get, started off as an ex prisoner. That's right. I mean, when 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 your first stop when your first stop puts you in prison, when your second stop gets your uh, gets gets the, the church you founded gets them harassed and brought before the court, and your third stop they followed you from the second stop to tell everybody how bad you are. <laughs> you know, I think you. I mean, I think you raise a good point. By the time you get to Athens, you gotta. You do have to wonder. Were Silas and Timothy looking at Paul, going, "Are you sure you know what you're doing?" <laughs> so, I, and I guess that you know, I think that's a, and I think that kind of begs the question. So, so what? What? I mean, obviously, a part of any, a part of our experience whether as an individual believer or certainly as the church, is the experience of what we'll call failure. Um, the experience of rejection. So, so what, how, what are the leadership qualities that, that, as, that are necessary as you, you know, as you think about trying to lead through failure, as you try to think about leading through rejection? What's, What's necessary for that? How, how, how do you, how does a leader compel a, a Silas and a Timothy to say, hey, I know we've had it tough, but let's keep going. You know? <laughs> I think some of it goes back to that vision mm -hmm. that when you fail, you have to be able to say, yes, this is a step mm -hmm. that didn't go well, mm -hmm. but okay, let's take the next step and see if we can, can correct what we did wrong on this one or correct what the mistakes were that caused us to fail or just brush the sand off our sandals and go to the next place <laughs> and start over. Uh, you know, you, ha you, ha you still have to keep that vision in mind. Mm -hmm. And if you have that overall vision, mm -hmm. then, then you sort of step around the failures and keep going. Plus they had great faith um, and I think doing that, it, it really helped them along the way because he, they truly believed in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so spreading that news, I think, was what they needed to do, and they thought so. Yeah, I last, think, yeah go in ahead, last week's uh, In last week's lesson, we saw Paul extolling the virtues of the Thessalonians because of their changed lives and their enthusiasm, and the, the, the mission was obviously having some success there. Okay, yeah. so is is enthusiasm and success evidence of the work of God and the Holy Spirit? And if you say yes, then let me ask you about some of these cults. Like I remember the Moonies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Great enthusiasm. Yeah. They were successful in terms of numbers of converts. Right. And yet uh, we wouldn't necessarily say that God and the Holy Spirit were at work there, uh, right. or would we? How, how, do you, um, how do you define success in missions? I, I think that's a great, that, that really is a great question. And, and it kind of, I was getting ready, I, I was going to comment, and Dave, you kind of leads right into it. I, you know, I think part of all of this is under, you know, is learning to, I think part of where all this comes in is, be, is learning to see even the successes that are present in the failures um, in Philippi. You had the conversion of the jailer and his household. You had the, the girl who was, who was uh, uh, possessed by a demon that was exorcised. Uh, mm -hmm. In Thessalonica, you had this community, of, this, this community that did come together, even in the face of persecution, and, and, and formed and established a church. And as Paul, we talked about earlier, Paul talked about the evidence of the transformed lives um, uh, uh, because of the power of the gospel. Um, you know, I, I, I do think part of it is learning to, shall we say, seeing success even in the failures, um, maybe redefining a version of success. And Dave, I do think there is an aspect in which we can say that, yes, sometimes I'm, I'm going to use the word passion. Sometimes the, the, the presence of passion is a sign of, hey, you know what? 
we're, we're following the vision. This is, you know, I, I, exactly. I, I, it, it's that, you know, it's that evidence of God saying, yes, I, I'm putting the energy within you to do this. Um, and so I do think that passion can be evidence of that. Now, you raised, you know, shall you say, you raised the, uh, uh, the, the point of, of, of somewhat having to slow, slow the roll a little bit, because like you said, cult, you know, there, we can name all kinds of cults where numerically they had success and where there was a lot of passion and energy, but we would say they were far from the will of God. Um, and I think, I think part of where, and I think this is where, shall we say, the discerning spirit has to be a part of leadership and a part of a community's assessment of leadership. Um, you know, and, and, and it goes back to, and it's something we're going to get, we'll look at here in just a second, how is that leadership, how is that vision grounded in the gospel of Christ, in the message of Christ, in the ministry and life of Christ? Um, and what we, and I think in many cases, what we would see in many of these cult situations, though there was numerical set success, though there was great passion and energy and dedication, when you hold up that, shall we say, third arm of the discerning spirit, we would see, okay, here's where things fall short. Because when we look at what's being taught and what's being practiced, there's a disconnect between that and the gospel of Christ. I think when we look at Paul, that's one of the things we see is that constant refrain from Paul that, you know, look at us and see, to, to see how everything that we did, everything that we said connects back to the gospel of Christ. And so I think that discerning arm becomes that kind of necessary counter to just being caught up in passion and energy. Um, that's that that that's kind of my response to that. Let, let's. I think this this kind of makes a great point to to, to look at this text and and to look at some of the specific examples we see here in First Thessalonians chapter two. So. I'm going to turn us to 1 Thessalonians 2 at this point, um, because I think one of the things that, that is interesting, and it goes back to something we've said, is, is I do think Paul is really talk, is providing a model of leadership, and I think intentionally is trying to provide a model of leadership to the Thessalonian church, and in doing so, he's not doing that to brag about what a great leader he is. I think it goes back to something we said last week that for Paul, modeling was an important teaching element. It was an important teaching method, especially with a community of believers, many of whom were new to the faith um, and, and new to, you know, they, many of these were Gentile converts and perhaps had had exposure to, to, to Judaism and to Jewish scriptures, um, but, but many, but probably their exposure was not, was very limited um, and, and not for a long time, uh, not for an extended period of time. And so in many ways, these truly were new converts to the faith. Um, and, so, and so Paul had to not just give words, he had to give example. And we talked about that last week in terms of theology, and I think he's doing the same thing here in this passage in modeling leadership and holding up not only his personal example, but the example of leadership that his ministry team provided. So well, I she, think, go ahead, Anne. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I, I think, too, that Paul showed leadership and the fact that he didn't ask others to do something that he would not do. For example, he did not expect a handout wherever he went from the people that lived there. He and Sal, uh, Sal, Sal sorry, I went and made tents during the day. They yes. worked during the day and they worked at night. So they made their own way, yet he still was teaching them about Christ. Exactly. Exactly. And let's, let's go right to it, because that, that's going to get right into this passage. I'm going to read the first 12 verses of, of 2 Thessalonians 2. If you've got a Bible, I invite you to follow along. Um, but, but really, this, the, these first 12 verses are really kind of the core part that I'm going to focus on. But we're going to talk a little bit about 13 through 16 as well. But let me read these verses for us. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. 
For our appeal does not, a spring, does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. As you know, we dealt with each, of, each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So a couple of things I want to I, I want to point out here for today. First off, notice the, the negative examples that Paul gives. You know, we didn't come to you doing this, 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 or this. Um, you know, one of the things that's kind of, um, I, I guess, maybe is, 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 it has to be kept in mind is that in that day, in that culture, um, you had, I, I guess what you would call, and it sounds weird to say to our, mod, it sounds odd to our modern ears, but in that day and age, philosophy was entertainment, okay? Um, you know, people loved, you know, they would love to hear a good philosopher. I mean, and, and I mean, uh, Stoic, you know, Socrates, uh, Plato, you know, they loved philosophy. They ate it up um, the way we, you know, the way we binge watch Netflix shows, they would, bin, you know, they would binge listen to philosophers. Um, and, but, and, and so in that day and age, it was, it kind of became a, a common to have these kind of traveling philosophers who would travel from town to town and city to city. Uh, and in some ways, you maybe still see something akin to these kind of folks in our world today. Um, if you ever do much late night television watching, um, and, uh, you know, the person that will come on and, you know, they've got the secret to how to get you out of debt. Um, and if you'll just send them two payments of ninety nine ninety five, they'll send you their book of, of how to be debt free in 10 days. Um, oh, no. <laughs> You know, There's always a sucker out there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was the same kind of, you would have these philosophers who would come along and, you know, they, they come into a city and they give a little 10, 15, 20, 30 minute hour long speech. And they'd say, hey, if you want to hear more, just pay me, you know, X amount of dollars. Um, and, you know, and, I, you know and, and all they were trying to do was really just make a buck. So Paul is coming along and he's saying, hey, look, we didn't come to you and preach in order to make a buck. We didn't come to you in order to boost up our ego. We came to you because we were commissioned by God with a gospel message that we were asked to bring to you. Um, and, and so Paul is really, as part of this, he's trying to make sure that the Thessalonians understood that there's a difference between what Paul and his ministry team did and what these other traveling philosophers did. And the key difference came down, shall we say, to source. It came down to motivation. They were motivated by personal interest. Paul says we were motivated by the call and work of God in our life to come and share this gospel message with you for the sake of your life. Um, and, and that's an important point that kind of, and, and, and I, you touched on it earlier. I think that's an important part, thing that has, it, it kind of lays the foundation for, for, for Paul's kind of model of leadership is, right. uh, is what I'm going to call integrity, faithfulness to the source. 
Paul said, the model of leadership you saw from us was leadership that was faithful to the source of our, of our work. And that's the work of God in our lives through Jesus Christ. Um, and so Paul really was, connect, everything connects back to that kind of, that, that fundamental integrity um, that Paul was holding up. As you look at these, as you look at those verses, how, how did that integrity manifest in leadership to the, in the Thessalonian congregation? How, what were the manifestations of that integrity that Paul kind of highlights in the passage? Or maybe a better way to say it is, what were the fruits of that integrity? Well, in verse 5, where he, said, where he says, uh, we never came with words of flattery, mm -hmm. no pretense for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, mm -hmm. whether from you or from others. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and in yeah. honesty. Yeah, there's, there, there was honesty, honest, honest communication, honest motivation um, was kind of a fruit of that integrity in, 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 for, for Paul and for the church. Why, why does that... Why would that have been an important fruit, especially for a Thessalonian church made up of new, new believers? Why would that kind of honesty in speech and honesty and motivation been such a critical component of, of leadership in that kind of community? I think it shows they were sincere. Okay. In what they were doing. They, knew that these, they knew that these new Christians were struggling they were trying to figure out this new Christianity. Mm. And so they needed straight answers. Mm. They needed honest answers that they could depend on. Mm. In today's world, we'd say they, they talked the talk, but they also walked the walk. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I always think about, um, you know, the word that, that always comes to mind when I think about a passage like this is the word authenticity. Um, and, and I think especially, certainly in a Thessalonian church uh, of its day and time, uh, but I think even in the church today, um, there is, as the church looks at its, at its ministry in the world, the need for authenticity is so critical to the work that we do, because let's be honest, so much of culture and society approaches the church with a critical eye. Um, and it would have been no different in the, in, in, the, in the Thessalonian day where they're living in a culture that already looked at them somewhat, you know, hey, you know, you, you could cause problems for us. You could cause difficulties of us when it comes to the Romans. If they hear you talking about another king and you're not willing to worship the emperor. So there was already some, some uncertainty around this group. And so there was already doubt. There was already uh, questioning of their, of their motivations. Were they going to try to lead some kind of uprising? Um, and I think in, our, in the world today, I think as the church so often, culture looks at us with a critical eye. They look at us with a doubtful eye. Um, you know, they, 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 they're, shall we say, they're ready to jump on our hypocrisy. And so authenticity becomes a real critical trait of leadership throughout the church, a real critical quality of the church, because... Well, they didn't want to be bamboozled. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, it, 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 let's be... Because what's the catch, you know? To, right. You know, we're, we're, what, they don't want to be scammed. Yeah, you know, and, and I mean, I think the same thing. There's that, you know, okay, there's got to be something in it for you. You know, this is... Ultimately, there's a catch here, something where I'm going to have to, it's going to cost me something and you're going to benefit. You know, I mean, it's that, that kind of mindset it was there in the Thessalonian, it would have been there in the Thessalonian community. I think it's there in our community today. And so that authenticity, um, that integrity, that, that honesty, walking the walk, talking the talk, sincerity, all those things became such a critical part because for the church to function in the community in which they were in, those were going to be absolutely fundamentally critical to their mission and ministry ongoing in the community. Mm. Okay, so Mark, you're saying that the people didn't want to be exploited. Yep. And they were being asked 
in a real sense, to take a risk in yeah. changing their behavior compared to the other people. What about exactly. a third element there that I see in some of those verses? And that is that Paul seems to be saying, we shared relationship with you. Yes. How important do you see that in missions work, as well as just sharing the gospel, yes. to actually share relationship with people? There is, I, 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 this is, I'm, this is great. I'm glad you, we glad you asked that question because that, um, I, I'm going to try to take what would be a 30 minute sermon and condense it into a 60 second. Oh answer. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, heard that before. <laughs> there, there, there is a great book that I would uh, encourage anyone and everyone to read. And the author, I'm blanking on the author's name. I can't remember the author's name, but the book is called A Nazareth Manifesto. And in that book, um, the author looks again at the ministry of Jesus as, as described in the Gospels. And he highlights what I think, what I, after I read it, I realized has been really truly an overlooked aspect of Jesus's ministry. And that is that Jesus came to be with us. We talk about Emmanuel, God with us. But when you look at Jesus's ministry, so much of Jesus's ministry was predicated on being with people. We often focus on the what he did for people, but that doing for flowed out of his willingness to be with. I think when you look at missions in our in our world today, and I don't think really truly, I think it's it it really is exemplified in Paul's ministry too. That willingness to first be with people is what opens the door to the not only the proclamation, but really the exploration and living out of the gospel message. Because that's where the relationships of honesty and trust are established. That's where people get a chance to see firsthand the impact of the gospel up close and personal. Um, I think that being with that relational piece is absolutely critical. And when, it's interesting when you look today at kind of the modern approach to missions, um, our whole vision of missions is changing. For, for so many years, we thought in terms of we were going to send missionaries to this part of the world where they were going to do revivals and they were going to uh, preach and they were going to, you know, they, uh, the focus was on preaching and proclaiming the gospel. And what's happened is over the last couple of decades, missionaries have come back and said, hey, look, yes, we're, we're, we're proclaiming the gospel. But the thing we learned was we couldn't proclaim the gospel until we had built a sense of relationship and acceptance within the community. Until the community saw us as one of them, they weren't willing to listen to us. However, once they understood that we were here not just for six months or nine months, or a year, uh, that we were here long term, and they understood we were part of, then they were willing to, to listen and accept. And I think, for, and I think to me, the sense, the, the thing I'm amazed by is that Paul, Paul obviously had a gift for relationship, because he was obviously able to develop a close-knit connection with communities like Thessalonica, where especially in the, the case of Thessalonica, he was only there probably a couple weeks. But yet somehow he had an ability to, to really build a, a sense of connection and relationship that allowed that relationship to continue to nurture and the gospel to continue to be proclaimed, even through letters as they were separated from one another. So that relationship piece, I, I, I do think that's a, especially from a leadership perspective that Paul and his team modeled the, the importance of, of relationship was an absolutely critical component. And, and I think if, if you look on at the following verses, beginning with verse 7 through 9, you see Paul describe that relationship. Yeah. We weren't a burden to you. We cared for you. We loved you. Um, we, we made our own way. We worked so that we were not a burden. So I think he describes some of that relationship there. Yes. That, you know, he, he begins by saying, this is what we didn't do, but here's what we did do. No, notice the imagery he uses. He talks about like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children, 
like a father with his children. First off, notice that he's willing to use both a female image and a masculine image, which is kind of an interesting thing in that day and time. But even more so, notice the sense of development. You think about a nurse with children, you think, especially in that culture, you would think more younger children. You talk about a father and his children. In that culture, oftentimes fathers didn't become more engaged in the life of their children until the children were a little older. And so the fact that Paul is drawing on, on both, is connecting both of these images, nurse and children, father and children, is showing a sense of development. I, we, we are interested in being a part of your development. Um, you are new, you from a new church, new young believers to your, to your infancy, childhood, early teen stage, um, adolescent times. You know, we're, we want to be in relation. You know, there, it's a commitment to a sustaining relationship. You know, even though they're not physically present, it's a willingness to keep that relationship connection in some way, shape, or form, which is part of why this letter exists. This was Paul's way of keeping that relationship alive. Do you think that uh, Paul presented himself not as some outside authority figure who's come in with pronouncements from on high, but instead he's, he's presenting himself as, as a fellow journeyman on a journey and inviting people to join him yes. in that journey? Yes. In fact, one, uh, one, uh, uh, one commentary I was reading this week uh, about this particular passage talks about how if you look at the entirety of the letter of 1 Thessalonians, there is a, there's a, you, you hear Paul use a lot of walking imagery, a lot of journeying language, um, and, and, and and Dave, to your point, meant to communicate that very idea. I'm not, you know, I'm not the authority figure coming to tell you this is what to do. I am coming with you and inviting you to walk with me. This is a journey we're on, and I want to journey with you. Um, and even that language of walking, of journeying, that is found throughout the letter uh, just emphasizes that idea that I, this this is something I am with you on. Um you know, and, 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 and yeah, I think that's very much, I think a very, very critical part of the, of the letter. I want to, I, I want to, let me, let, uh, one other thing I want to just point out here that I think is, is, is worth noting, um, and, and just talk about for just a second. Verse 10. You are witnesses, and God also, of how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. Paul bragging. One of the commentaries, I think, said that uh, Paul may have been, and his team were accused of being immoral, and that he's responding to that criticism. Ronnie, you, you, you touched on it just a second ago. What had happened in Philippi? Paul got thrown in prison. That's right. That's right. Paul came, Paul came into Thessalonica as an ex-convict. I mean, in one sense. I mean, that, that did. So, yeah, I mean, Paul is trying to argue against an understanding that he was a criminal, that he was a shady character. Um, and so, again, he's saying, hey, you know, Look at how we lived when we were with you. Did you see anything shady? Did you see anything underhanded? Did you see anything unrighteous? And, you know, um, you know, I, I think it's easy to kind of, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ann. No, I'm sorry. That's my dog. He can't oh. see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, but I, I think. Sorry it, about that. No, that's okay. No, I think I just I think I just think it's important to understand that, that Paul here is not being uh, this is not hubris, this is not self righteousness on Paul's sake. This is very much trying to address what what may have been a charge that um, you know that that was circulating around, especially with it in the community from outside 
talking to the church saying, hey, why are you listening to this guy? Don't you know what kind of guy he is? Um, you know, we know that uh, from the Acts 17, we know that uh, some of the folks that caused problems in Thessalonica followed Paul to his next stop uh, and talked bad about him there, trying to undercut the work that he was doing there. So there was probably this messaging to the Thessalonian church of, you need to be watch out for this guy. You need to be wary of this guy. And so Paul's not trying to brag. He's just trying to say, hey, look, you saw what kind of people we were up close and personal. Uh, you saw it with your own eyes. You heard it with your own ears. You lived with us for that time. You know, you know that this isn't who we are. Um, so it just, uh, I think sometimes it's easy to maybe hear a cockiness or, or a self-righteousness. And I don't think that's what we're intended to hear in those ver in that verse. So. I, I, I think it's, it's some of Paul's teaching too, because he's setting a standard here mm. by which the, the, people of Thessalonica can judge him and others that may come along behind and each other. Mm. But he's, he's articulating a standard. Mm. We talked about, I think that's a great point because we talked about that. Um, uh, we talked last week, I, I, I look at the example of, if you look at, go back to chapter one, verse nine, uh, where Paul talks about how, um, you t how you talk about the Thessal Thessalonians, how you turn to God from idols to serve a true, a, a living and true God. Um, and we talked a little bit about that sense of transformation. And I think you're right. I think, Barbara, that's an important point. Paul is also holding up here. Hey, look, here's the, this is the standard for which you should seek to, you know, seek, you should strive for. Um, this is the, the kind of life you should strive to live. You should look for it in your leaders, but you should also be looking for it in yourself. You should be striving for it in yourself. Um, and I think, yeah, Paul's wanting the, that model of a Christian life um, that he's holding up here. You know, I think there's also a part of this that, that reminds me that Paul is calling people to a gospel that will that will possibly impact their very uh, living. Yes. It, it they ultimately may lose their lives. Yep. And so we talked uh, Barbara mentioned the standard. I, that's that's a standard that we don't often have to come face to face with. Yep. But these people, I mean you're right. This was new. This was a new teaching. Mm -hmm. But it was a new teaching that would lead to many, to many, uh, to much persecution. Yeah. So I think Paul is, you know, he's calling them to something, and by by his very words, is is implying how serious mm -hmm. this must be, the mm -hmm. consideration and the determination to follow, mm -hmm. because it it could in fact be their very living. And I think to that point, I think even that just emphasizes, I mean, think about that. If, if you're going to be persecuted, how much harder is it to lead a life that's right. pure and blameless and upright? <laughs> but, but if I'm going to give my life, I want it to be for a higher standard, a yes. higher. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, it, so that brings it, I think, actually makes a great point to then transition into kind of the, the last couple of verses that I want us to look at today. And that's verses 13 through 16. Let me, let me just read these verses real quick. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word which is also at work in you believers. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own compatriots as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They displease God and oppose everyone by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Thus they have constantly been filling up the measure of their sins, but God's wrath has overtaken them at last. 
Now, these verses have been a source of uncomfortability <laughs> for the Christian church for a good while. Um, because there are some who wonder if there is a, uh, a, 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 a message of anti-Semitism contained within these verses, uh, a blanket condemnation uh, of the Jews. Um, I think it's important to first off remember that, that this is Paul, a Jew, who's writing, okay? <laughs> Um, so I, 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 I think any reading that, that sees this as a blanket condemnation of the Jewish people uh, is, is failing to, to, to take that part into account. I do think, though, that what we can, what, I think what's happening here in these verses, and, and I think how it ties in, is that Paul is... Paul was very up for, I mean, you think about it, Paul is, has, is saying, hey, look, from the very beginning, the gospel message has encountered affliction. From the very, you know, shall we say, persecution, Thessalonian church, ain't just happening where you are. Mm -hmm. There are other congregations, there are other communities who have, just as you have, experience the, the type of affliction, the type of persecution that you are facing. Um, and so in one sense, he's trying to say, I think, to the Thessalonian church, hey, you're not alone in this. But on the other hand, and this is where we get into some of, some of that theological framework that Paul's teaching from, Paul's also saying, hey, look, it, it kind of ties back to the pure, upright, and blameless. How do you respond to that affliction and that persecution. Um, and what Paul's saying, I'm going to connect even with what Paul says in Romans a little bit. I think this is the earliest vestiges of that idea that he will manifest later of saying, you know, don't repay evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the foundation of that idea, because what's being said here is, hey, look, the people who have been persecuting and been afflicting, don't worry God's got it. God's going to take care of them someday, some way. So don't you worry about getting, you know, your focus shouldn't be on how to get back at them. Your focus should be on living the life that God has called you to live, a life that is pure, upright, and blameless. And I think that's an important point to understand here because I think especially Thinking about the model of leadership, it's that question of, do you want to model anger and vengeance, or do you want to model holiness and righteousness? In the situation and the circumstances that the Thessalonian church was facing, those were really the two choices that were before them. They, they could be driven by anger and a desire to get back at those who were hurting them, or they could be driven by a desire to live faithfully the life that Christ died and rose again for them to live. Either would, in fact, this one, the life of vengeance, might be the life that would be more anticipated and expected. But Paul was saying, don't worry about this. God will take care of this part in God's way. So take this off your plate. You focus and let your leadership focus on being a people that are holy, upright, and blameless. And so th this is, I think, the early, kind of the early stage of Paul's theological development of the sense of uh, what I'm going to say. Paul's, you know, we've talked a little bit about it already. You know, Paul's idea of the already and the not yet. Christ has come, and the kingdom has, has come, but it hasn't come in fullness yet. There are still echoes of, there are still vestiges of the old broken creation. And the old broken creation is fighting against the kingdom of God. But there's going to be a day, a day that we're waiting for, when the kingdom will come in full, when the old will pass away, and look, all things will be made new. 
And that's going to happen at God's time and at God's direction. So Thessalonians, don't you worry about getting revenge. Don't you worry about paying back those who are hurt, hurting you. Instead, focus on living out the kingdom life that God's called you to live. I think that, that, that's a really important point. It's easy to kind of get caught up, I think, in, in his, you know, kind of a, shall we say, is this a blanket? I don't think this is a blanket judgment against the Jews. I think Paul is addressing a specific circumstance here and saying, hey, look, other churches have faced the same thing. The temptation is going to be to focus on revenge. You focus on living the kingdom life. Other questions, comments about this this part of, of Paul's letter? Do you think the last part of verse 16 is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD? Well, the, I, what I will say is there were certainly those who interpreted it as such. Um, there, there were, there were certain, there is certainly evidence that some within the Christian movement interpreted the, the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, as, shall we say, God's punishment on the rejection of Christ as the Messiah. Um, that, that has certainly been an interpretation that has been put out there. Well, this would have been prophetic on Paul's part if he wrote it. Do you think somebody else added that in? Well, and that's, that's been another, there, because some have wondered if this was a, if this is, if these, especially verses 13 through 16, if this is a later addition to the letter because of the, shall we say, the Thanksgiving portion in verse 13. You know, Paul's already done his Thanksgiving, um, and so it, he didn't usually do Thanksgiving again, and so some have wondered if this was a later addition. It's hard to say, in my opinion. I actually, I think it makes sense to be part of, if it was part of Paul's, if it originally is Paul, part of Paul's original letter. Because again, I think it, it, it ties in with, with what Paul's just been talking about in verse 10 uh, and connects back to where to put your focus at in terms of the Christian life. Um, and I think it also, in this letter especially, um, we, we're going to hear Paul giving thanks even again. And I think all that's going to set up what he's going to say at the end of the chapter, at the end of the letter, when he talks about giving thanks in all circumstances. And we're going to have seen him be giving thanks throughout the letter. So to me, I'm, I'm comfortable with this being part of Paul's original letter. I understand why some struggle with it. And I understand why some wonder if it was a later edition. Uh, perhaps, you know, closer to the fall of the temple in 70. I'm comfortable with it as, as part of Paul's original letter. Well, um, our hour's up. Uh, I, I thank you all for, for being part of, uh, of this conversation today and thank those who will be watching it later. Uh, next week, uh, we are going to start, we're going to pick up at chapter 2, verse 17, and we're going to look uh, at the end of chapter 2 and the entirety of chapter 3, um, and, uh, and, and we're going to focus, the theme next week is going to be on um, the, uh, the, the distance, the church at a distance. Um, we have been living over for the last six months in a socially distanced world, um, and, and we have, uh, and, and, and that's been a, an unusual and unique experience for us. But um, I think what, uh, one of the things that we're going to look at next week is, is understanding that this has not been a unique experience in the history of the church. Uh, in fact, the idea that I want us to think about next week is that, quite honestly, our experience of the last six months probably better correlates to Paul's entire experience of the church throughout his ministry. <laughs> Um, and so we're going to talk about how we see in Paul how church at a distance certainly is a struggle, but how there can still be joy and how there still can be a sense of unity, even at a distance. So, uh, so that's where we're going to focus on next week. And uh, the material for, uh, for, next week's, uh, for next week's lesson, uh, I, Melanie will send it out either Saturday or Sunday. 
um, and uh, the study guide for next week. And uh, so you can be on the lookout for that in your email inbox. Um, the video of, uh, of today's session will be, uh, I'll be putting that on our Facebook page later today. Uh, so if you want to share it with anybody, let anybody know who maybe uh, missed it and w wants to catch up on it, uh, invite them to, to come and take a look at it. So, but thank, Lainey, you thank you for joining us today. So, oh, thank you. I uh, thank you all for being a part of it. Uh, good to see everybody. And I hope everybody has a great and dry rest of the day today. Thanks, <laughs> thank Mark. you. Bye. Bye-bye.